figure who would have 20 minutes to present um, his presentation on understanding legal and policy frameworks to address world economies in honor of Africa. Once we have that opportunity, then we will invite the rest of the panel, whom we will introduce later on, um, to basically discuss not only the overall subject, but also reflect on um, country-specific experiences. So I'd like to invite Abby uh, to, the, to, to the microphone. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to quickly run you through um, the legal frameworks that govern war economies. Perhaps I should give a very short definition of what a war economy is. Um, if you can go to slide number six. Basically, a war economy in the, in the context of this area entails the role of natural resources in perpetrating and funding wars on top of what we call illegal trade. Um, allow me to give one example. The DRC is renowned for its mineral resources. And it's not a coincidence that the country has been endless wars since independence. The evidence shows that actually the combatants, including the rebels, exploit these natural resources from diamonds, to gold, to timber, to fund these wars. technology. Um, I guess I'm going to go on this one. Um, there, there's basically three types of war economies. The war, first one is what we call combative. This is a situation where the combatants, where the people, the rebels or the fighting forces themselves exploit those natural resources or indulge in um, criminal or uh, illegal trade to raise money to do the fighting, to raise money to buy arms, to pay soldiers, that is called a combative war economy. The second one is, yes, the second one, I've got it now. This is what you call a shadow economy. I'll give you examples of each of these. Again, um, you find a conflict happening country X, but then the proceeds from that war, and here we're talking about uh, economic proceeds, um, benefit or affect the next door country. Again, I'll give two examples. One would be Uganda, one would be Ethiopia. When there's conflict in the DRC, somehow the gold exports of Uganda go up. Is that a coincidence? That means that the minerals exploited from the DRC end up in Uganda and Uganda markets them. The, it's not always negative. The other example I can give is uh, the case of the war between Ethiopia and Eritrea. Because Eritrea had closed its border with, Eritrea, uh, with Ethiopia, 
Ethiopia opened up another corridor through Djibouti. Djibouti was not part of this conflict, but that port was largely built because Eritrea and Ethiopia had closed borders. That's part of what they call it, um, a shadow uh, war economy. The beneficiaries or the parties to the shadow economy are not necessarily involved in the, in the, in the fight. The next type is a coping economy. What this means is people who are caught up, these are usually very simple people, who are caught up in our situation, strive to survive. Again, these are unfortunately always civilians who will find different ways of making, uh, making ends meet. Women end up doing petty trade just to survive. Um, when there was a war in northern Uganda, women and others who were caught up in the struggle ended up selling, um, we call it marwa here, or um, basically simple, simple things in order to survive. Um, there isn't too much work, uh, time to go through um, the details of how each of these manifest. Um, what we're going to do now in the name of time is to dive into, dive into um, the legal frameworks. Um, two, I'm going to jump this one. Um, there are two legal frameworks that govern this area of work. One is international law, or we call international instruments. There's a number of them, and almost all the EGAN members are signatory to each of these covenants or international um, instrument that I refer to. The first one is the United Nations Covenant Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. This has a relevance in that when um, these combatants or uh, the, um, the products from war zones end up on the, on the international market, usually, usually through the conduit that is not uh, legal, um, when there is a war, usually the first victim of war is uh, the rule of law. Yes, that goes out of the window. You can imagine um, a fighting force trying to export a resource they've exploited through the legal channels. Is that possible? They'll inevitably end up going undercover, smuggling, money laundering, and all that and all that. That is prohibited by international law. As you can see, um, Article 6 requires member states to take legislative measures to establish criminal offenses against corruption and money laundering. Corruption is part of uh, what fighting forces use to sell their products or import uh, goods illegally, uh, bribing customs officers, etc., etc. Um, then there's the United Nations Convention Against Transnational. Again, that is the same, same convention. Um, that is what's required of member states. Article 6 requires member states to take legislative measures, establish criminal offenses against corruption and many um, money laundering. The next one is Article 7. I don't have the time to go through all these. Uh, this may be available to you later, but what each of those articles deals with uh, laws that will make it difficult, if not impossible, for the fighting forces, and obviously this usually ex uh, excludes states, because these are uh, legitimacy to, to trade. But this is um, targeting rebel uh, organizations. Um, article 7, that's done. Uh, again, let me see. That's gone. Um, the next covenant is what we call the protocol against the illicit manufacturing of and trafficking, trafficking in firearms, their parts and components and ammunition. I think this is pretty um, self-explanatory, the fighting forces cannot keep fighting unless they have access 
to arms. And usually, again, we are talking about those in the rebel state. That's the only way they can um, get arms. Um, I'll just ask um, an open question. Look at the situation in, uh, in Ethiopia. How do you think that the Tigrayans are getting arms? They don't have a state in, in, through which they can import arms, but somehow they are getting arms. So usually under Ethiopian law, these arms are being illegally um, received. And that's what one of the uh, targets of this particular international covenant or, um, or instrument. Um, with is another international instrument. This is the United Nations Convention Against Corruption. Again, it goes to when um, rebel movements or those in combat are fighting, are trying to uh, obtain um, arms or exporting their loot, usually this is done um, the backward way. And corruption is always part of this. Yes, as I mentioned before, um, for their goods or loot to go through the uh, borders next door, they often use bribery, which is a form of corruption. That too is prohibited by under international law. Then let's look at um, what we call regional instruments. There is, oh, sorry, I've lost this. Where is this technical guy? Okay, there is the African Union Convention on Preventing and Combating Corruption. Again, this echoes the uh, United Nations Convention Against Corruption, and again, it covers offenses of bribery, money laundering, and concealment of property, and requires proceeds of crime to be confiscated. Be mindful that all these instrument, uh, international instruments have been signed by all of these member states of EGAD. The next one is the OAU Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism. That was 1999. In as much as that particular instrument was targeting terrorism, if you look at its provisions, obviously it can be used and it has been used to uh, fight illicit trade, illicit trade in arms, drugs, and money laundering all of which are conduits through which um, rebels or those in conflict use to sell or procure their arms and whatever they need to keep on fighting. Next will be there's a protocol to the OAU Convention on the Prevention and Combating of Terrorism. That's 2004. Again, that echoes the international instrument, uh, the one I mentioned of before. And again, this requires member states to undertake to seize and confiscate funds, assets meant for. You can substitute the word terrorism for fighting force because one of the things I've noticed is that every time there are, are rebels within a given state, those are re rebels are almost termed terrorists, so you can substitute that. The key thing is not the object, is not the purpose of the, or of, of the, of the inter international instrument, but rather whether its um, articles can be used to combat war economy. The next instrument is the Nairobi Protocol for the Prevention, Control, and Reduction of Small Arms and Light Weapons in the Great Lakes and the Horn of Africa. Again, this international law that has been signed to by the member states of EGAD. Um, among its provisions is the prohibition of illegal trade in or movement of small arms between member states. Again, this goes to perpetrating the, uh, the war because let's be mindful one thing, you cannot have a war economy unless there's a war. The two are I call them, they have a, a, an ignoble symbiotic relationship. No war, no war economy. So war causes the war economy. And as long as the warriors, so to speak, or the, uh, the fighting forces can access 
resources fight they keep on fighting and uh, one of the things they, they need is arms so this particular um international treaty uh, prohibits the uh, illegal trade in and movement of small arms within the, this region and again under this international instrument states are required to adopt legislative measures to criminalize one illicit trade in small arms two illicit possession and misuse of small arms and light weapons um i don't know how much time i have what i've done is just i wanted to focus on besides international um instruments each country has uh, its own domestic legislation and one of the things i've done i've looked at the domestic legislation of ethiopia south sudan uganda kenya somalia and, and, and sudan um, and um, one of the things came through is that whereas the names of the laws may differ for example in some jurisdictions called the criminal code in some jurisdictions it's called the penal code but when you go through them the particular articles or clauses that are relevant to this subject matter are pretty identical so that's what i've done i've said let me let me focus on ethiopia and raise what i found in their domestic law that applies in this subject matter one they have the criminal code the criminal code enforces all relevant domestic laws and international conventions and treaties and it prohibits illicit trade in gold precious minerals stones as well as currencies it prohibits contraband or smuggling it prohibits gaining from proceeds from piracy and looting yes because one of the things that happen in war um, situations there's always a lot of plunder of the natural resources it pro prohibits uh, money laundering and proceeds of crime and drug tra uh, drug tra trafficking ethiopia also has an anti-money laundering act which basically requires cross-border travelers to declare all currencies negotiable instruments and precious metals in the metals in their possession to customs officers upon request and customs officers have the power to have the power to seize um all these possessions if they are not fully disclosed um, there's also a requirement that uh, financial institutions do due diligence in transactions um, for example this is aimed at prohibiting uh, money laundering you don't go and deposit 20 million dollars in, uh, in an account in ethiopia without disclosing the source and this also uh, applies to what they call international money transfers you can't wear money to um, an account in ethiopia um without disclosing the source if the amount is for example of concern hundred thousand dollars or so and let me go back and keep saying if you look at this piece of legislation that applied to ethiopia they are replicated across the, the entire um, horn of africa all these countries have similar clauses in their different legislative piece of leg legislation um there's a requirement it's called the firearm administration and control Pro uh, act or uh, proclamation again this prohibits sales of weapons to third parties it criminalizes carrying a gun illegally and bans trade in weapons um perhaps you may not see the link but as i keep on repeating myself where there is war there's likely to be a war economy so if you can somehow combat or prohibit weapons of war um means of fighting that may um it will reduce the quantity of the way economy and some of these wars cannot be sustained unless especially the uh, the rebel movement are able to access arms resources and often food to feed their people i think i'll stop there and leave some time for my colleagues there's a lot we can talk about in the discussion about somalia and um sudan south sudan north sudan kenya and uganda 
Thank you very much. Just one last uh, remark. I, from my observations, the issue uh, of conflict in this part of the world is not the laws, no. Each of these countries, six member states, each of them has adequate international and domestic law to combat conflict and war economy. What I find lacking is one, the operational effectiveness. There is a principle in law that says that a law is as good as it is effective. The laws we do have, both at the international level and at the domestic level, but it's the operation that are lacking. And sometimes um, we don't have the institution, the institutional frameworks are very, very, very weak. And I think that unless we plug those, the laws by themselves will not salvage this part of the world. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, uh, Brother Meshega. Um, I think this, this presentation was um, quite pertinent for the discussions that will ensue uh, in a moment or two. Um, our brother has basically laid out uh, the legal frameworks, policies, both international and domestic. And while he talked about Ethiopia in particular as an example, um, laws regarding AML and CFT, anti-money laundering, uh, um, countering finance terrorism, I think are all in place in all the federal, all the sort of member states within EGAD. As he rightly pointed out, the problem is not adopting laws. The problem is implementing those laws effectively and efficiently. Um, and I think that's where the challenge is. Um, so now. I think we have an opportunity to, to welcome uh, a discussion. Um, some of these discussions will be country specific. Um, we have five uh, 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 colleagues who will discuss a uh, number of areas. First, I would like to invite uh, Rob, Robert uh, Lukey, who we have uh, now, we call him Uluso, I think. <laughs> Um, who is now the, uh, who is the chairman of the Land Commission, a, an excellent lawyer who has given enormous amount of his time and intellectual capital to help uh, his brethren and his, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, fellow citizens in South, South Sudan, and now here to um, share, uh, um, you know, his experience with our colleagues across the board. So welcome. Would you want to sit there or do you want to come up I here? Okay, super. Then I can I can sit there. Well, yeah. <laughs> you have how long? Five, five, seven, five to seven minutes. Okay, let's see. Well, in the first place, I would like to thank the moderator and the panelists and all attendants. Uh, I'm given a very interesting topic that reflects where I come from. As an introduction, Sudan and then it became South Sudan. We went to war before independence by four months. And as I speak now, there are parts of Southern Sudan that are still at war uh, with the center. Uh, the Sudan got its independence in 1956. I'm giving you a very fast background so that you know the country you're talking about. 1956, 1st January, we got our independence. But there was already a mutiny in a place called Torit, not very far away from the border of uh, Uganda. In 1972, there was relative peace in what was called the Addis Ababa Agreement, signed in Ethiopia, under the patronage of High Selassie of Ethiopia. Uh, the turning point in southern Sudan was on the 16th of May. 1983, when a battalion rebelled in a place called Bor, and it actually triggered a war that was led by uh, the late Dr. John Garan. From 1983, I was mentioning this date because 
from 1972 until 83, almost 10 years, this is where we had relative peace, where many of us went to school and studied. Since then, there have never been any peace. Now, you imagine the kind of economy that was operating from 1955, when we went to war, until the Southern Sudan seceded in a popular referendum uh, after signing the Comprehensive Peace Agreement in 2005. I could remember uh, Omar al-Bashir, the Austin president of Sudan, was saying, we better live in peace as separate countries than we'll be constantly at war as a United Sudan. And I think that was a very, uh, very intelligent way of putting things. Because if you are united and always at war, you better separate and be in peace. Everybody wants peace. Uh, the turning issue that I would like to go through, what was the situation of the economy in Southern Sudan when we went to war uh, from 1955 almost until 2005? The roads in southern Sudan were not tarmacked, so you imagine there was no any proper trade and commerce, only the movement of the army and some petty goods to do trade here and there. There were about five factories that are not really factories in the real sense. We have the agro-industrial factory in Anzar established by the British, the teak plantation in many parts of southern Sudan, specifically Gatoria and Bahar al-Ghazal. And that was intended by the British colonial administration to have mature teak so that they have furniture for their colonies where the sun does not set. When it is morning here, it will be morning somewhere in Jamaica. Again, there was what was called the wow fruit canning factory, which was built by the Russians, but it never took off. Until one time it was made for manufacturing beans because it was actually staying without any work. The sugar factory in uh, Mangala, Molot, and the sisal factory plantation in a place called Toy, Gilo, this were the few industries that were there. And this shows the pathetic situation of the economy as it was. Now coming back, what are the potential resources that will help to make an economy, whether the country is at war or at peace? We have oil and gas. When we were growing, we didn't know the Sudan had oil. We only know Saudi Arabia, Libya, where people go and work there because those were rich oil countries. What we knew that we had was livestock that many people had discussed about. They're in millions. And where I come from, there are people who could marry even paying 250 heads of cows to get a woman who was below the age of 18. The other resources that we had, the Nile. We know the Nile starts from here. But many of it goes through Sudan. It is actually the vein of the heart that we have, where we get our fishery, the wildlife, all the riches are all along the Nile. But Egypt benefits more than what we do because we have arable land with rains ranging from 10 months to about 11 and a half in areas near Central Africa and the Congo. The last resources that we have, we have a very big area of a country that is scantily populated. You can travel for three days in southern Sudan without seeing a human being or an animal. Now, an economy operates with some legal support. The presenter here was talking about the legal framework. Where we are at war, you rarely talk about the rule of law, but you talk about the rule of the gun. And that really helps either to control the economy prevailing 
or it spoils it. I would go through a number of uh, documents that during the Civil War we were using. First was the Manifesto of the Sudan People's Liberation Army Strong Movement. The army was stronger than the movement. And later on, I will alternate and to tell you how. We had the laws of 1984 after the rebellion. And that law was basically not talking about how to handle the economy, but how to handle the gun and how to treat people who mistakenly or willfully shoot people or who kill people or those who abrogate the rules of combat. And the guy, very provident, uh, provident lawyer, who actually drafted it, and uh, I would will hold the name, it later on said that very law which he drafted was turned against him. And he was in prison until he disappeared. The other law that we had, it was not a law, but different manifestations. After the fall of the government of Mangisto Hail Mariam, who was a very good supporter of the movement, we had a split, Nasser faction and Torit faction. And it's still prevailing. Where well, here the president is SPLM in the government and his deputy Riyak Mashar is SPLM in the opposition. One was actually in Torit faction, the other one was in Nasser faction. So each one was trying to control the economy of his area. And what was there? The type of trade, you could have butter trade, which was very rudimentary. And those who had chance to export fish to the government-held towns where they get money and they come either to help the movement or the faction they are under, or maybe to pay some little taxes. The other law was to discipline the army, senior army officers. And they had a place in Arabic, they call it Moesokun. Moesokun is hot spring, which was near the border of uh, Kenya. They were to discipline how to treat the people, whether they business, people, or civilians. And we had also a conference on civil society organizations. Because civil society was considered to be an enemy of the movement. Those who didn't want to fight were forming civil society and were bringing things like human rights and all this. And normally in war, uh, people don't talk of rights or duties. They talk of who is killed and who is to be killed. So these are a few things. And then we had uh, the Chukudum Convention of uh, 1994 to form the National Liberation Council as a parliament, which I'm now a member of the National Liberation Council to take all things for development, whether economy, politics, and so forth. And we had what is called the Civil Authority of New Sudan, CANS, to take care of the different executive branches. Now with this, what type of trade, which was prevailing by then in terms of economy? We had, as I said, we had butter trade, and the most important trade was to capture a town so that from there you'll get guns, you'll get food for the army, and you'll get a lot of things. So when there is a mobilization to capture a town, everybody volunteers because there you'll get money. You can break into uh, a bank. You take the loots and the rest to support the movement. So the economy was... Uh, a, a, a one that you, you fight in order to get money from the government held areas. The other type of uh, economic activities, you know, Southern Sudan is endued with a lot of riches. The shea butter, which is a very important element of making these lotions. We have shea butter from a place called Wao in Bahar Ghazal up to the border of Uganda near Moyo. It's just wild, it grows in the bush. But when you cross the Uganda, you don't get it. I don't know whether it is only made for Southern Sudan or, or maybe in a few areas. And this shea butter was getting a lot of money. We, the, the local uh, NGOs, they had a machine for making, pressing this oil. 
in a place called Rumbek and Maridi, where they exported to East Africa quietly, and money was got from there. The other source of income or activity of trade was the palm oil. Southern Sudan had, from equatorial type of climate to semi-arid. So the areas bordering in Central Africa and the Congo, we have the palm oil, which they could press for food, and then even manufacture soap, but not for export quality, but to be sold internally, so that the people would use it. And the other economic activity was the cattle. Poor as our cattle, the quality, but during the war, especially when West Nile of Uganda was at war, the only place where to get uh, meat we, from cattle is southern Sudan, from Bargazal. Our people used to come and sell in West Nile around the areas of uh, Aru and so forth. Now with this, we know during war, we don't have a legal framework that is very much clear, but there is an economic activity where the butter trade and people go footing the cell. The most important thing that for our women was to brew alcohol in the government held areas, including Khartoum. You know, when Sharia was declared in the Sudan, the old breweries were broken down. So the only alcohol is the locally manufactured one, whether it is Kasese Kasese or Lira Lira or name them. So when they sell, they get some to educate their children or also to support the war efforts. So these are the economies that were really operating there. Finally, the issue of the oil. When oil was discovered, people were always fighting whether they, we don't want to call it the rebel movement, the freedom struggle or the freedom fighters and the government will struggle to capture a town so that they stop uh, the government from benefiting from this oil because if they export oil, they will arm themselves and then cause us problems. But if they get arms, then the rebels, actually the freedom fighters, will try to capture towns so that they also get guns from there. With this, I think these are the few things that I would like to share with you and I give rest for the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so from legal frameworks to what basically happens uh, on the ground and, and, and fantastic anecdotes of what has basically transpired in South Sudan in regards to, to war economies. I will be very stringent for other brothers. I think I've been, I've been accused of being lax in terms of uh, making sure that time is observed. Uh, for those of you who have made that comment, you will pay for it. Um, uh, jokes aside, I want to now invite Hassan Ibrahim. Hassan Ibrahim is a former member of parliament of the federal government of Somalia. Um, he is a political scientist um, who has been trained in the UK and has been one of the authors um, in terms of uh, the, um, the country assessments. In particular, he has undertook, undertook uh, fantastically um, the, the status of land issues in Somalia. So he will eliminate, I think, uh, give us uh, a bit of um, uh, explanation as to where we are, um, uh, and of, of course also historically. So over to Hassan, please make sure that you stay within the confines of the five minutes provided to you by the moderator. Thank you. Whenever law is passed, this, you know, it affects someone. So I'm the victim, first victim of the, the time rationing. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sherwa, uh, the moderator. Uh, uh, and this session was very important, to be honest, and would have been much better if the organizers to put this session for the first days when the people have energy to listen. And now I can see the people are so exhausted and very tired and everybody wants this. Uh, to go home. I will not be, uh, I will not take too much. Our session is war, uh, uh, war economy. And normally this war economy is references is when a country uh, fights with another country and how it is resources they mobilize 
you know, to achieve a military goal. Uh, for that, uh, Somalia, it's a unique case and uh, it merits, to be honest, to have a one session on its own. Because uh, we've been in conflict since 1977, one way or another. Uh, I will be very uh, brief. The best reflection of uh, the war economy in Somalia when it comes as a government, it uh, goes when Somalia had a proper functioning government uh, before 1991. Specifically, I'll take a reference for the one, the socialist government of Mohamed Siad Barre was in place. Uh, the government at that time, they achieved a lot of goals for the first 10 years by writing Somali language, paving thousands of uh, kilometers of roads, doing a lot of infrastructure in agriculture, fisheries, livestock, uh, and food security. Uh, everything was just in place. And all the, the problem started when we went to war in 1977 with Ethiopia. And then when the country started to descend, and that is re really the reference of war economy. When you when you have a uh, war with another country, normally just you have to spend a lot and uh, mobilize your resources to achieve the military goal. After that, the country just descended to the bottom, unfortunately. At that time, Somalia was one of the uh, highest GDP in Horn of Africa, re developing rapidly. Uh, I will, lay, I will take some examples uh, for the conflict of Somalia from 1988. From 1988, we were fighting within ourselves in one time, and another uh, fighting with Al-Qaeda affiliated uh, terrorists like al Shabab. Economic collapsed, infrastructure disappeared, the jobs declined, farming, fishing, etc. Uh, at the moment, whatever this government has, we are spending nearly 50% on security. Our budget is very small, and a high proportion of that budget comes from direct budget support from uh, donors. We only have a small revenues to, to generate. And also, we have uh, ATMIS, formerly called AMISOM, and the AMISOM also just, uh, they spend nearly a billion uh, even though the EU and other donors are paying, but that money would have been much uh, better to spend in the Somali security forces if the country is intact and would have been much better. And that is just part of the examples of the war or conflict, you know, uh, causes uh, a lot of harm in economy in every way. Whenever there is a conflict, there's a third party benefits uh, or in one way or another to boost their economy by selling ammunition, uh, vehicles, armored vehicles, the modern technology of you know, our warfare technology like drones, communications, and other logistical needs like uh, uh, fuel, food, medical equipment, equipment etc. When the institutions collapse, uh, like Somalia, or if you have an institution and the institution is very weak, uh, the other powerful group become organized. And those organized uh, groups, whether they are uh, you know, within the country or outside, they harm the economy. In Somalia, many uh, organized uh, groups are benefiting and having a pressure in Somali economy. Specifically, I'll take some examples, like charcoal. The charcoal production, it caused it, it was industrial level exporting to the Middle East by using for the pipes, the smoking pipes and whatever. Uh, it has caused a tremendous pressure uh, to the land, specifically agriculture. It caused desertification. It caused land degradation and soil erosion. Uh, and also just it, it, it uh, pushed people not to farm because of the, the, the people who are benefiting that, the, uh, the agricultural business, the, the charcoal business, just you are forcing people not to, to do uh, their farming. Also, another example for a lack of marine security, a lack of, the absence of proper functioning institution, caused IIU, yani unreported, international uh, unreported fishery, 
illegally for, uh, fish, fish, fishing in our, our, our waters created by piracy. How do we just have an... an okay. Uh, okay, I will wrap it up. I will, uh, okay, I told you I was, I'm the very first victim. So the piracy and all of these things cause it, uh, pressure to the country. Uh, this is, uh, these groups, there is a lot of issues to talk about, even the Hawa Shabab generates, you know, uh, the, the revenues within the land, but I haven't got time, as I earlier said that the merit, Somalia uh, issue merits in one session on, on its own. Uh, there is a lot of laws that we pass, similar to what my uh, colleague Uganda was saying. Most of the laws is specifically are the same when it comes to the money laundering and, and etc. Uh, uh, Somalia have now a new financial reporting center, it's called FRC, and those are just specifically targeting the illegal uh, generated money. The Somalia is a unique case, but I don't have to, time to if I go to the Shabab case and how they benefited the system and how they penetrated and benefited the lack of, uh, of, 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 of proper functioning institutions or they benefited the, the, the weak of institutions. I think it's, it's a severe and it's too much, but I will hopefully just will have another, another time to cover. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Anija Hassan. That was very succinct. Um, now I'd like to invite uh, our brother um, Umar Ajami, uh, who is a, an associate professor at the University of Khartoum. Um, he will, of course, share uh, his reflections in Sudan. Yeah. Seven minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good uh, afternoon, everybody. And uh, also, uh, it is a pleasure to be with you in this uh, very important uh, session. In fact, uh, what I'm, I'm going to give very brief re reflections uh, informed by my knowledge of uh, Sudan and also inspired by what I heard over the last two days uh, in the discussion uh, in this uh, uh, conference. Importantly, I could say that uh, war economy, it is an area of uh, expertise, special expertise, and I do confess I'm not an economist or a member of the judiciary to know about these laws, but I look at war economy as an outcome from the war itself. It is an outcome that may turn later into even a cause of conflict. So as far as the theme of this uh, conference and its expected outcomes, uh, I think the issue is about conflict, how the conflicts create uh, 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 war economy. And war economy is about the resistance. It creates distinct economies that contribute to the resistance of the conflict, the institutionalization of the violence itself. And here we could also look at different forms, as uh, the presenter of the paper correctly mentioned. Under conflict situations, different forms of uh, shadow economies flourish, from trade in arms, tra tra uh, trafficking of narcotics, tra uh, trafficking of uh, human beings, dif different forms. Even sometimes we talk about creation of landless people where that these areas could, could, could be kept uh, for uh, exploitation by war lords. And here specifically, it is about the war of minerals. Now we are in a world where it is more about the underneath wells of the, uh, of the earth, especially precious resources, more than uh, uh, the surface resources of the earth. And this is a critical issue. He mentions the DRC. We saw it in Liberia. We saw it in Sierra Leone. And now we, see, we do see it in Sudan, and particularly uh, in uh, places like uh, Darfur. For me, also, the war economy is one of the least costs of the conflict because human sufferings, human tragedies are more expensive than the economic cost. Human lives. Now, 
uh, in Sudan, we have around 3.5 million people displaced and living in uh, IDP scam for more than 20 years who lost all the whole of their properties, the whole of, uh, the, the whole of their uh, assets. And these are the issues that we have to, uh, to look at. Uh, I'm also inspired in, in this context that as uh, practitioners, as academics, and even in uh, uh, people working in the international organization, that we need to have a thorough understanding on conf on, of conflicts. We need to look at conflicts as systems, as systems with different actors, with different hats, actors who are directly involved and direct actors who are indirectly, actors who are satellite uh, managing the conflicts for the conflict for, by the remote from overseas. All those do have yeah, the interest or vested interest in, uh, in conflict. Some of the conflicts for me become like multinational corporations. Like therefore, it is about just like a multinational corporation, everybody has interest in it. Whether in the international community, in the NGOs, in the academia, in the farmers, in the USA, many others have vested interest in the continuation and uh, institutionalization of the conflict. So the question and the challenge for us, how to address the root causes of conflict, how to minimize conflicts so we can curb the issue of uh, war economy and other social ills uh, related uh, to, to it. In this respect, also we may need to look at what we could call yeah, greed versus uh, grievance, and human sufferings. This is also an issue, you know, how a few, few greeds are contributing to the sufferings and uh, ignoring the grievances of millions of people. So this is also an, uh, an issue that uh, uh, the member countries have to look at. It is not an easy undertaking, but we should consider, and uh, later, just within two minutes, I, I think I could uh, look at that. Yesterday, also, uh, just uh, some issues related to that. It is about land grabbing. Also, yes, uh, yesterday mentioned, and it is part. Sometimes I look at it as part of the uh, war economy. And all of these are reflections of the weakness of the state. Irrespective, we accepted that or not, land and issues of land are issues of politics. We cannot ignore that. And this later will uh, let us think about how we address the issues of land in this uh, conference. From the first day, and even up today, we listen to, and uh, just uh, repeatedly about conflict as a result of climate change, desertification, desertification and uh, immigration. I think we should be more courageous to talk about the reality. It's a reality, it is about politics. At the same time, talking about desertification and land degradation, they are telling us that 70 or 80% of the communities do not have secure rights. So it is not about climate change or desertification. They are structural roots that we have to look at and we have the courage to address these political uh, uh, structural co or causes of conflicts. Maybe another issue that I have to look at, it is about knowledge production, information uh, availability or information sharing and the implementation of the uh, recommendations, including the recommendations of this project. I think this is also an issue that we have to, uh, to look at seriously. Many of our communities, smallholder producers, pastoralists and farmers and a group, a lot of groups of uh, women have been cut from what is going in the world. The, whole, the old universe, my friends, have disappeared. We are living a new reality, a new re reality of control by the market economy and even the global commitment to market economy and the rapid transition. Our, most of our producers have not been equipped with the skills 
to keep with these challenges. They are still farming, still raising livestock as their ancestors did 200, 300 years ago. So these are issues that we have to look at. And finally, uh, Mr. Adam, just to come to the issue of uh, how to go for change. For me, it is about political reform. The issue of land minimization of country uh, of conflict is about political reform. It is, we know, in the region that a process of democratization is going on, and this is go very good, but still, our main problems in the region is about politics. We always talk about political commitments. Who are these politicians? From where do they come? They come from our society, but this disconnect between the institutions and the communities, I think is an issue to be addressed. And I think for EGAD and its partners, the role of the youth, the role of civil society in addressing these issues and to equip them with the knowledge about the status of land. This is their own future, how to be equipped with the knowledge, how to help them through uh, join platforms that they should come to get together to discuss these issues they are we know they are supported by the international community to come around issues of gender rights and gender-based violence all these issues it is good but still the land remained a very yani, or a, a, a relegated a very secondary uh, position in uh, issues related to use and uh, uh and gender maybe the last is about political parties. Talking about land as part of the, as essentially a political issue, I think it is about accountability of our political parties. Accountability to the society, accountability to the uh, uh, electors. And here, I, I tried in Sudan, for, just for the assessment of, uh, country, for the country assessment, I had a meeting with 21 political parties. None of these parties, has included as the issue of land or natural resources in their political manifesto. And this is may, maybe one of the major challenges for us, how to improve the political performance our poli of our political parties, how to promote our democratization process. Unless we address these issues, I think we will not go very much further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor. Such an impassioned uh, presentation. I think um, it's, it's very important um, to highlight, of course, the nexus between politics, economy, or, or, or the war economy, and of course, also climate change, um, and the plight of the IDPs and, and others. And the fact that there is a responsibility uh, for regional organizations and international community um, uh, to combat uh, some, of these, some of these issues. And now, I'd like to invite um, our colleague Abebe, uh, who will uh, share with us his reflections on Ethiopia. Um, uh, Abebe is a lawyer and a po policy, public policy um, expert, um, and he will share his, uh, his reflections on that great country, um, Ethiopia. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. <clears throat> uh, I think first, uh, I thought that we were going to deal with uh, uh, war economy as defined uh, as the organization of a country's production and distribution uh, capacity during conflict. Okay, that is what what uh, war economy is uh, or does mean. <clears throat> Uh, so what I want to try, to, what I want to uh, share with you is, uh, you know that Ethiopia has been in conflict for the last two years, and uh, how is the country uh, managing or uh, adjusting its economy to deal with uh, the insurgency or with the uh, with the war? <clears throat> because you know everything is uh, allocated to the war, to the war effort, and uh, uh, distribution or building the economy uh, is endangered from two uh, very uh, uh, different points. 
the laws that has been cited or that have been cited by the first presenter are actually were enacted during the, the normal times and uh, they could be uh, used during war times but uh, during this war time uh, there are various issues that emerge that could not be controlled by legislation or or emergency legislation or uh, policy uh, these problems that impact on the economy arise from two fronts uh, from the local and international front. From the local front, uh, smuggling of weapons, uh, money laundering, uh, you know, uh, undermining the local currency uh, or those uh, supporters of the insurgents in the, in, in the towns are trying to undermine the local currency and the economy uh, by various means. So the government has to deal with all these things. Secondly, the uh, uh, the, the production or the producers, the farmers, the use have to go to war and, uh, uh, you know, agricultural production uh, uh, will be uh, endangered or is endangered officially. <clears throat> so how is the, the, the country trying to accommodate, uh, uh, to, to, to deal with these problems? You know that the country has uh, uh, launched a cluster farming system uh, that amalgamates uh, smallholders and it has been successful and uh, these are you know how to deal with uh, such kinds of things uh, the other is from the international front internationally uh, you know social media the propaganda war is not uh, really uh, very easy <clears throat> the government has to respond to that to, to, to has to spend a lot of money to to respond to uh, uh, these people social media people you know that they are paid uh, and they don't care whatever news they get, they, they, they will distribute that. Uh, so this exacerbates the war. <clears throat> so the, the government has to repel that. And to repel or to, to defend that, it has to uh, also spend money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there are international interests, international uh, uh, powers who have some interest in, in this or in the other way. <clears throat> So there is an, eco an economic embargo, economic embargo from the superpowers. For example, the United States um, has uh, prevented Ethiopia from the Agawa uh, uh, <coughs> trade system uh, because of the war. Uh, European countries, uh, most of the countries or the European uh, economy, the European Union uh, has prevented Ethiopia from accessing to its uh, assistance, economic assistance. So in light of these problems, uh, the government is trying to adjust its economy uh, or uh, the war economy uh, uh, to these things. So various means are being tried, uh, various, various alliances are uh, uh, being tried, and uh, this is how the, the war economy is uh, uh, or the government is trying to deal with uh, the war economy. <clears throat> uh, in the local front, as I said, uh, uh, hoarding, you know, opportunist traders are hoarding uh, uh, consumer products uh, so that, you know, uh, grievance on the part of the people uh, will rise and uh, against the government. So it has to deal or it has to issue emergency laws uh, emergency regulations to deal with uh, such kinds of hoarding. You know, is a hoard, and uh, you go to the market, the price uh, is hiked, uh, and that is a, a very serious problem now. Uh, <clears throat> as I said, smuggling of uh, weapons. Uh, this is a really a very difficult one, a very difficult problem. The laws are there, but you know, the government has to do. Uh, to spend a lot of money to to to, to check uh, these activities, so this is uh, I know the, the the practice or the Ethiopian practice, uh, the Ethiopian experience could be beneficial to those countries who are uh, at war or who are uh, facing civil war. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, the the war economy in Ethiopia, and uh, I'll be glad to answer your questions. Uh, I've limited myself to adjustment of the economy during wartime. 
uh, but issuing laws wouldn't help in this time you know uh, yeah it, it could be helpful but for example if you issue um, uh, social media laws how are you going to d deal with uh, social media people who are outside the country <clears throat> it's very difficult so uh, these are okay <clears throat> Uh, so these are the, some of the major problems that uh, uh, the laws and policies could not uh, be effective uh, during wartime. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and now, last but not least, Abdurrahman Abdi Ahmed. Abdurrahman Abdi Ahmed is a, um, a Minister of Planning uh, for Jubilant State of Somalia. For those of you who are not perhaps familiar uh, with uh, the country, Somalia is a federal state which comprises of six federal member states, and Jubiland is one of its constituents. Um, so, Abdurrahman will, uh, Minister Abdurrahman will talk about his experience and reflections. I think some of the issues we also would like to hear about not, is not only um, sort of generic or general issues, but also specifically what Hassan re um, uh, referred to, which was sort of the charcoal, um, which, which has been part and parcel of the war economy in Somalia. Uh, over to you, Abdurrahman. Um, thank you, moderator. When you hear minister, what comes into your mind is comprehensiveness in politics and policy. So I'll be more comprehensive and uh, the technical issues and specific, my brother Ibrahim has already uh, presented. So I will be much comprehensive, thank you. Moderator, uh, my fellow panelists and participants, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Jubilee the State of Somalia, I'm honored to join you this high-level regional conference on land and conflict in the East and Horn of Africa here in Kampala, Uganda. I begin my remarks by thanking the government of Uganda for hosting this important conference and for characteristically warm hospitality of the people of Uganda that we have been privileged to receive since we arrived. I underscore IGADS and other international partners' responsibility as stewards to ensure that their shared aspiration of peace, prosperity, economic cooperation, and regional integration is delivered intact to our future generation. We also acknowledge the extraordinary partnership between them and Somalia, particularly Jubilee. The role of these partners in the Horn and East Africa cannot be overemphasized. On the local scene in the Horn of Africa in general, and Somalia in particular, the, exist the existential threat of terrorism hangs on our region's neck like a sword of democles. Terrorism has become under, under an unprecedented threat to international peace, security, and development. In this regard, we must all stand together against these inquisitive minorities who impediments our security and development. I wish to sincerely thank our regional and international partners for the concerted effort that they have put together in stemming the tide of radicalization and stalling the efforts and the action of these responsible for turning our people into tools of destruction and death instead being instrument of development and prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, currently Somalia facing one of the worst droughts in 40 years, leaving many people displaced. Over 7 million people are currently facing acute food shortage. As the situation worsens, this number is anticipated to continue rising. Jubaland State is a neighbor to the largest refugee settlement in the world, the Adab Refugee Settlement in Kenya and we are hosting the largest population of IDBs and returnees, of which the government is committed to finding a durable solution to this affected population. We therefore appeal to the regional bodies and international partners 
to join us in this in, in upholding this global responsibility as Jubaland is committed to creating a conducive and friendly working environment for all our international and national partners. Ladies and gentlemen, food security is a serious challenge the world is facing today, and in particular, East and Horn of Africa. It is estimated by the international agencies that by 2050, the world must feed 9 billion people. Yet, the demand for food will be 60% greater than it is today. Feeding human population today is already a serious challenge, meaning we are really looking at bleak future in terms of food security. To achieve these objectives, address a lot of issues for gender parity and aging population to skills development and global warming Somalia. Jubilant in particular is very a global warming. Somalia, Jubilant in particular is very rich in production sectors such as agriculture, fisheries, and livestock. We therefore looking for global cooperation for those productive sectors to be to be more productive by adopting efficient business model and forging public-private partnership, and also need to become sustainable by reducing greenhouse gas emission, water, and waste. Ladies and gentlemen, land is a primary driver of conflict in Somalia, and it has been the heart of the country's crisis for three decades now, and still there is a competition of a valuable land, pasture, and water source, as well as irrigable farmland. And those residing in cities and towns are disproportionately affected. Moreover, land disputes have exacerbated tension across several parts of Somalia. At the same time, Somalia has been the cast as the new frontier of oil and gas exploration, which has a strong potential to lead further conflict between contesting elites seeking access to oil avenues. Many substantive barriers have been identified which inhibit the resolution of these conflicts. These include fear of retaliation, and a, policy, a land policy and legislative vacuum, and the faculty of tapping into precedents by the courts or mediated by the traditional institutions, as neither keep written records. In addition, there is an overall lack of capacity, infrastructure, and expertise to solve land-related disputes. Land tenure is, is not uniform across Somalia, and a more detailed review will require a close examination to China types disaggregated by all federal member states, while extreme weather events and climate change differently impact China system in different ecological zones. The interface between land and governance and China security is most evident in the way that the weak land governance system in Somalia has impacted land rights and gender inequality possess a challenge in the traditional dispute resolution structures. Jubaland established land management authority that consists of several line ministries chaired by the first deputy president of Jubaland. Through this effort, we formulated land management act that facilitated our communities in rural and urban areas to have access to land rights and justice thus de-escalated land dispute in Jubaland state of Somalia. And it is our vision to create an environment where everyone has a clear and secure, and, and secure property rights, where, there is strong, where a strong land governance system supports investment and economic growth, and where sustainable land use practice are the norm rather than exception. Therefore, we sincerely appeal from IGAD and inter other international partners, specifically land governance sector, to closely collaborate with Somalia and in particular Jubaland to enhance resource mobilization, setting legal frameworks and systems, infrastructure, and institutional capacity development to actualize our vision. And finally, I will talk about war economy. The Horn of Africa has witnessed many incidents of violence conflicts in the last few decades. The nature of state power in the Horn of Africa is a key source of conflict, a political victory assuming winner takes all form with respect to wealth and resource, as well as prestige and prerogative of office. Moreover, political competition in the Horn of Africa is not rooted viable 
economic system. However, the resilience and adaptability of our local, of our local and regional actors are critical actors in determining whether and to what extent cross-border conflict and stability issues are successfully managed. In addition to immeasurable human and economic cost, including destruction of economic and physical infrastructure required for productivity growth and export diversification, the political fragmentation that arose as many countries aligned themselves with different power actors and blocs, the fragmentation sustained market segmentation and undermined cross-border trade and regional integration and equally undermines the efforts and the process of structural transformation to realize the potential of African continental free trade agreement, which has been taught before as a game changer. To achieve meaningful progress towards these regional goals, IGAD, AU, and other policy makers should fast track the implementation of African governance architecture to strengthen good governance and consolidate democracy. Related and equally vital for enhanced security is the building up for a strong, responsive, and accountable institution to foster inclusive growth and political participation. We actually need to broaden support for the African Peace and Security Architecture, which outlines a comprehensive strategy for conflict prevention and management that will smooth the transition towards a continental approach that is strengthening ownership, Africans' peace and security promotion plan, and it is alignment with the regional economic development strategy. I'm concluding, we would like to contribute to many suggestions and recommendations you have already received from different actors that Somalia need a land governance framework which is more gender sensitive and aims at achieving governance framework which is more at achieving equal opportunities for all citizens, men and women, inclusive in respect to land matters. I thank you. Huh? Uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm, he's finished on time. On cue. Um, I think uh, that concludes our um, uh, the discussions um, and observations made by the panelists. Um, I think we have learned a number of things. Um, so we've learned that the war economy is not so unique um, in terms of um, uh, not only Africa, but also the, the, the member states we got, and there is a, this is a quite common problem that we all share. While as, um, some states within the EGAD, um, uh, this is a problem uh, at a national level or national magnitude, others have observed it, can, it, 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 it is indeed um, uh, sort of quite local and localized. Um, and I think for, for obvious reasons in Somalia, uh, both uh, our colleagues who've talked about the Somali experience have indeed um, uh, extrapolated that the problem is, a, the, the magnitude of the problem is quite national. Um, we also have uh, heard from the colleagues that there needs to be a comprehensive uh, legal and policy regimes to deal with some of these problems that we are facing, both at the, at the national and the subnational level. Um, the first speaker um, aptly uh, demonstrated uh, that it's not about the lack of law or policy, but the lack of enforcement and implementation of those laws, which of course goes into the heart of um, the rule of law and good governance and, and, and the culture of constitutionalism. Because what is the point of having laws in the books if they cannot be enforced. So as a part of uh, uh, the overall discussions that we are having, and we have yesterday, as, as you were aware, we had um, chief justices and other senior judges. The role of the judiciary um, is quite uh, 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 important and paramount in order to ensure that laws are applicable. And they can't, they can't really apply um, those laws effectively if the judiciary itself isn't independent. I was, I was pleasantly, of course, 
surprised uh, some of the presentations by the executive yesterday uh, where uh, reference was made that the judiciary of our host country um, uh, were indeed uh, undertaking the constitutional, constitutionally mandated work, uh, which was sometimes finding, uh, making the executive rather uh, jittery. Um, at any rate, I think this gives us an opportunity to perhaps open uh, the floor for questions and comments from our colleagues. Um, I think maybe we take uh, three questions each, and then and then we will open um, uh, uh, for responses. Perhaps the questioner uh, may may want to point or address uh, its uh, you know the question to either a specific individual or the individual panelist that they might want to uh, uh, respond to, or it could potentially be a general one, in which case um, we will, of course, uh, do our best um, to ensure that one of them will be able to ably uh, uh, respond. Ajimi, yeah, hug. I think you need to come back. Yes. Um, so over to my brother, if you can, can we get the microphone, please? Yes, if you can, for, for our colleagues from the, um, from the audience, if they can indeed uh, tell us their names and the institutions which they represent. Thank you. Thank you, my brother Adam. My name is Walter Okidi <clears throat> I'm from Uganda here. I want to first assure you, your session has been the best so far. Why I'm saying so is because at last today in this session, we have put our fingers on the causes of all the problems we have been talking about for the last two days. This is the real problem. The war economies we have been having within this region because of the various wars we have been having. What uh, my brother Loki and Mushega talked about and the other panelists, we must take back the message that the longer war takes place in any country, the more the population gets used to the war economy. And once you get used to the war economy, it is difficult to stop it. That is what in the 70s we used to call it the Magendo economy in Uganda here. It was the Magendo economy. And what my brother Luki talked about the Lira Lira trade is still going on between Uganda and South Sudan. Today, it is now manifesting itself as corruption. And I can assure you, the longer you remain in that war economy, the more you will have corruption in your country and you will never be able to get rid of it. So we need to wake up now and start working on it straight away. This is the problem. We shall not address the land issues if we do not fight this particular one. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Very pertinent uh, comments. Um, the gentleman behind. Yes, thank you. He has already intimated that the panel is the best. I am very passionate about discussions on conflict. My name is Tom Balmesa Kisembo, and I do peace and development research, and I advise organizations in different capacities. And my areas of interest is basically conflict, land, mining, and women. But quite a number of observations. Mr. Mushiga, that, that was a very great presentation. And uh, my questions in my mind, being a student of conflict, as asking myself in these policy frameworks, who is punishable? And you know very well, you put it clearly that the laws as good as effective, but you know also very well that the law is like a cobweb. So we have all these actors who are busy going through the cobweb even as they do illicit money, money flows in our countries. So, I mean, those are questions to ask. And then uh, I look at, uh, I look at the, 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 the reflections on Ethiopia. Ethiopia, yes, you mentioned the war economies and how the Americans are busy putting more or less like embargoes on Agoa. And I went strictly to the, to the finance tracking service by UNOCHA 2020 to 2022. When you look at the figures there, 
if at all Goa has closed you out, I mean, if you look at the African countries, I think Ethiopia is one of the biggest recipients of US aid when you look at those figures. So while they close you this side, they are providing money the other side, be it through stabilization funds and all these things. So it is, I think, upon us to look at other ways how we could work out with the, with the, with the different donors. And then, uh, and then thirdly, yeah, I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the presentation from, from Prof from, the, from Sudan. And my only aspect is, apart from looking at, apart from looking at the, the way economy in terms of political economy analysis, it is, it is also imperative upon us to, to also note a systematic analysis of actors, but also the changing roles of actors in all these economies. Trust me, DRC not being part of IGAD maybe, but even in Somalia, some of us might be keeping in Uganda, but we keep reading a lot about how the changing roles of actors is very, very quick. And every other time you hear of a new group in Mozambique, the guys are coming up. So all these are imperative for us to discuss. And to me, the changing roles of actors is very key, especially when it comes to, when it comes to political economy analysis. And I would also, I mean, as a recommendation, I've been in quite a number of, in quite a number of discussions here, but the whole aspect of conflict sensitivity analysis is a missing point in most of the interventions. I think that is quite very, very good to consider in terms of programming. And then uh, lastly, I think, yeah, my friend has talked about governance, but I think also reorienting development policy to be more conflict sensitive. To me, that is the argument I always have because I worked in organizations implementing conflict sensitivity. We used to partner with organizations in Sudan, in Somalia. I worked with Safe World, and th there were some results you could see on ground. But these are some of the discussions I think Egan needs to put across as you look at all these other issues. So in respect to the panel, thank you very much for getting all these insights, especially on the last day, and we have talked about the real issues. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, brother. Um, I, it seems to, I mean, I think we, we are all sort of resonating um, some of the observations that have been made by the panelists. Um, perhaps I see that gentleman there, question? Or maybe perhaps question and a comment. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Kakoza Savio from the Equal Opportunities Commission of Uganda. And my question specifically is directed to Honorable Abdurrahman Mohammed. First of all, thank you uh, for your submissions. However, when you came to recommendations, you talked about coming up with land governance frameworks that are gender sensitive for equality purposes. But how do you intend to balance the issue of religion vis-a-vis -vis the secular laws. Because um, as I was looking through, I found that almost 99% of Somalia is basically uh, Islam. So how do you intend to balance up the secular laws with the religion for equality purposes? Thank you. I think you can you can respond from where you're sitting, Minister. Uh, thank you so much, my brother, for the great question. Uh, I want to put uh, into your attention that Somalia is uh, in post-conflict recovery, and we are in the effort now of rebuilding the state. So in this case, we don't have a complete constitution. Our constitution is in draft, and it's not completed. So uh, the government, with the support of international community, we are now uh, gearing or putting more effort on how the completion of the drafted constitution. And you know that a complete constitution is the guidelines of good governance in every state. 
So once we finalize the constitution of the federal government of Somalia, that is the time we can be able now uh, to, to, to segregate the, 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 uh, this, 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 this laws. Or, so maybe I can transfer my brother Hassan to it since we are on the same page. Thanks. Yeah, uh, just let me be brief and uh, I'm in line with my uh, colleague and friend, the Minister of State for Jubaland. Uh, I was member of parliament as my uh, honorable, uh, the moderator mentioned earlier. The Somalia, uh, since the collapse of the central government, uh, our laws are not uh, made uh, unagreeable or just there is no referendum yet. The Somalia before it was a centralized government at the moment is a federal uh, system. Uh, every federal member state has its own constitution and the, the constitution are not harmonized. Uh, but mostly just when the federal member state constitution there is any dispute or any issue that can uh, uh, you know, cause any any miscommunication or, or issue or, or argument. Normally, they refer to the, the to the constitution draft that we have, which has been passed in 2011, redrafted, uh, amended, but not uh, made into a proper. But that's we are still using it as a draft constitution, is a reference for the government and reference for the people. I think that's what I need to add. Uh, uh, but in, we, we're hoping that uh, soon that constitution will be will be made uh, a draft, uh, will be made a public and uh, you can find it as, as a reference in the, in the internet and it, it, it's, it's widely available. And all the questions, I think you can get the answer from there. Anything that you can get back to us after the session. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah I, mean, I, I think um, just, I mean, I, I'm one of the drafters of the provisional constitution. Um, so our constitution is provisionally adopted. There are certain areas that hasn't been settled on, especially on issues related to resource sharing, uh, fiscal federalism, um, the status of the capital city and issues of that kind. But the, 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 the current constitution is provisional adopted um, and it's actually in force. So that is the basic law of the country. But yes, I, I absolutely agree. There are certain areas uh, that needs to be elaborated further. Um, any other takers? Yes, my dear sister. Can we have uh, the microphone, please? The mic to... Uh, good afternoon. Uh, first, I thank all the panelists for this interactive uh, session. Uh, all of uh, presenters or speakers are uh, uh, raise the issue of the land conflict and economy in a narrative way. Uh, this reminds us all as a region uh, to look for a deep analysis and look for the measuring, the, imp the impacts and the consequences uh, of this, uh, of this uh, issue in terms of the figures uh, so as to facilitate the land monitoring uh, in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Two more, perhaps. Okay. Perhaps I would give uh, an opportunity to uh, the professor, um, if you can perhaps, uh, uh, you know, shed light to some of the issues that you thought you didn't have time time on, or, or also reflections and commentary that was made. Thank you, Professor. Okay, I will start. Thank you very much, and uh, also thanks for uh, uh, the issues raised. 
by the floor. I, I could just respond very quickly to these issues of, of laws and policies. Policy, uh, and I think one of the problems in, in the region is uh, lack of law enforcement mechanisms, the very uh, low level of policy and uh, uh, law implementation. And also, this is a reflection of the weak institutional capacities. And I think this will be even to support peaceful resolution of conflicts, to sustain peace. I think uh, one of the priorities will be how to equip our institutions with the capacities and capabilities to perform uh, their uh, mandates. Most of our institutions today, for me, I look at it as extractive uh, inst institutions rather than being inclusive, socially responsive institutions. So this is an issue that we have to invest in. Another issue is related to uh, information. Absolutely, uh, Susan, I do fully agree with me with you. Uh, that is one of the major limitations is about information, up to date information. And for us in the Sudan, for example, the federal system as adopted since 1992 has resulted in the fragmentation of information. The uh, cooperation between the federal government and the state government is one of the weakest points in the federal uh, system. So it is still an issue of governance that we have to, uh, to keep uh, base with. I think the, yani, the fragmentation information, lack of uh, gender disaggregated data is remain a big challenge for us that we have to deal with. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I think um, federalism, uh, when you look at the United States, uh, yeah. which has adopted yeah. many moons ago, um, that evolutionary process, it takes actually quite some time for yes. these institutions to take root. Initially, uh, at the beginning uh, of the, the, the advent of, uh, of federalism in the US, for example, um, the states had huge amount of power. Yeah. As, as time went, went, went by, and people basically gave credence to the idea of United States yeah. and the legitimacy of the state has increased and social contract was there, yeah. that balance now yeah. is uh, uh, skewed, skewed towards the uh, federal government. And I think, I think we will, of course, see that. It's just a matter of time. Yeah. It is about you know, legitimacy. It's about social contract. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, I think there was a question about um, the culpability of those who are engaged in our economy. Um, technically, it's the person who is caught um, who will be culpable. Uh, for example, if you are a customs officer and you assist um, a person uh, smuggling goods into any country, it's you who is going to be held accountable. Um, the nature of uh, conflict and uh, the resu resultant uh, war economy is such that the big fish will hardly ever be caught. Um, I, I keep going back to um, the case of the DRC. If you've got a commander uh, who is busy um, exploiting uh, gold or diamonds in the DRC, the likelihood of getting this person crossing the border into Rwanda or Uganda or, or Sudan is very, very minimal. Um, that's um, so. It's the person who is called that will be held accountable uh, in accordance with the national laws. Uh, as as mentioned earlier, uh, Somalia uh, has been in conflict over thirty years, and it merits a session on its own when it comes to war economy. I have not prepared more because of the time constraint that we have. There is a lot of uh, examples that in Somalia that you can learn. Uh, it is not a positive sign how the war and the conflict are being benefited. Not only the organized groups like the piracy and uh, the Al-Qaeda affiliated group, Al-Shawab, how they tax people and they generate revenue. Also in the business community, uh, when the system collapses and there is no uh, system to control when it comes to the quality control and you can export and import whatever you like 
They bring a lot of foods which are not adequate and uh, fit for consumption, medication, which is not fit for, you know, a human being and a lot of things. And they benefit a lot. And uh, it's a mar market controlled uh, people or gang, whatever you like it. Uh, they have a lot of system in place and they protect it. Uh, and it's impenetrable because the government is still, is still weak. The institution is very weak because we're struggling to uh, eradicate the Shabaab and, uh, and get uh, proper control of the, you know. And this is just some examples that yes, you may need to know of. They're making billions and billions, investing in many other countries, but people, those uh, places that they invest, they believe maybe this money is just, you know, uh, honorably end or, or maybe honestly end, whatever, but which is not, but it's not. But we're getting there, but there's a lot of uh, things that uh, are going on in, in, in when it comes to the conflict profiteers and those who benefit. Thank you. Uh, I'm very happy that I didn't have a question, maybe because <laughs> I'm a country that has uh, lived in conflict for so many decades. Uh, during the, uh, the armed conflict in uh, Sudan, the southern part during the war, they made sure they don't want to use anything that belongs to the government, including the laws. But at a later point, they had what was called the ground rules, which had a lot of uh, things from the international law. The ground rules was made during the Operation Lifeline Sudan, in which uh, the SPLM signed a memorandum of understanding with the UN to observe you know, like the rule of combat, prisoners of war, to allow the free flow of the relief items and all this. So there was at least uh, a follow up for the international uh, uh, laws in armed conflict. Again, the right of belligerence in the issue of Somalia. You, I would never thought Somalia had no constitution up to now. But still they have some laws which they follow of the old Somali system before it collapsed, whether it is to do with criminal law, to do with civil uh, transactions and all this. At least there is something. Britain, they don't have a, what you call a written constitution, but they have bills that they follow. So when you say Britain has no constitution, they say why? But they have you no know, bills. The bill, for example, of women's rights and all this. So Somalia, they have all the other laws but less of the constitution. Maybe they will have to go and it's easy to draft a constitution, but how to observe the other laws is actually a problem. Finally, uh, I did not mention that during the armed conflict, we had what is called the civil and the military administrators who are acting as judges, as well as the military rulers. Though it was not a good uh, thing, but at least to fill the gap, because you can be a military at the same time, a judge. Sometimes the military will fire squad somebody extrajudicially, and the case is brought before him. So, but this is a state of war. When there is war, there is normally a breakdown of the constitutional machinery, and there is no uh, rule of law, and we always say rule of the gun prevails. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, as an as a, as a English trainer, uh, lawyer, um, I remember the first uh, constitutional administrative lecture that we had, I went to a rather archaic university. So our professor started with saying that we don't have a constitution. And somebody asked why. And he said, his constitutions are for uncivilized people. <laughs> um, but, but of course, I digress. I mean, there is a constitution in Britain. It's not written down. Uh, there are founding, basically founding documents um, all the way to you know, Magna Carta, um, the Human Rights Act in 1998, all those things, conventions, they are part of the constitutional um, uh, documents of a country. And, and Somalia does have a constitution, by the way. It's just that it is provisionally adopted, yes. Um, any further questions? I think we're coming, coming to, towards the end or concluding of this session. Um, perhaps I might give five minutes to any additional questions or comments or clarifications that some, some of you may have. If not, of course, yes. 
Sorry, um, uh, going back to the previous question, um, under international law, some international crimes actually have uh, an international jurisdictional um, application. Uh, for example, if you review the, the treaty um, on international crimes, every state has an obligation to enforce that law. So if you commit that crime here, you can be handed down by Interpol and be arrested in Somalia and tried there or Sudan. So you have to make a distinction between uh, domestic crimes like theft of a chicken and uh, being involved in um, something like terrorism, uh, money laundering, yes, you can be charged in any part of the world. Okay, so Adam, would it be correct for me to appreciate you? Um, I think we have one one last comment from the colleague here, and then I think we will conclude, uh, Doctor. Thank you. Let me share the microphone. Uh, Mr. Sam Mr. Mushega actually reminded me of something which is critical about uh, international laws, these instruments, whichever which we have been adopting them. There has been in Uganda since 1967, 1970, 1979, 1980, 85, and 86, in that order, we have something we call legal notice. Always is legal notice number one. Eh? What they do is that the government promulgates this legal notice number one saying, whatever anybody did in the process of the prosecution of this war, which ended in this taking over government after now, all of them should be amnesty, all canceled. So you cannot prosecute anybody. I don't know whether you, you can, these other international instruments would work beyond these legal notices. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you very much indeed. I think, uh, it is time, and I just would like to take this opportunity to thank our colleagues from all the uh, uh, EGAD member states who have done such a wonderful job in illuminating, I think, one of the most uh, murky uh, subjects within this conference, and that is war economy. So thank you very much. It was a great honor. Um, looking forward to you know, continuing these discussions at the margins. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists as they take their seats. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've now come to the tail end of our three-day conference. And uh, I think it's only fair that we take a couple of minutes to reflect. But before we do that, I'd like to take a special moment to, to recognize the chairperson of the Uganda Parliamentaries Parliamentarians Land Management Forum. She is the woman member of parliament for Chiboka, Honorable Kaya Christine Nachimuero. Let's give her a round of applause. She's been with, with us here for the entire time. Honorable, thank you very much. We will give you time to give us a few words of inspiration later on during the, the afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we are also very proud to have with us the Minister of State for Urban Development, Honorable Obiga Kanya. Big round of applause. Big round of applause. It's an honor to have you here with us, sir. Thank you so much for making time. And as we have people coming in, I've realized that we've had such a hectic day. James, are, James, are we okay? Okay. I, we've had such a hectic day. I'd like everybody to stand up for a second. Let's kindly stand up. It's been such a and a jam-packed three days of, of, of hard work. And you know, as, as a veterinary scientist, you know, the biology behind w working in the afternoons is that after you've eaten, digestion kicks in. So blood moves away from your head, goes to the stomach. So people like falling asleep. So what we like to do is that we would like everybody to wake up. So turn around to your neighbor and say, wake up. Look at you and say, wake up. Oh. All right. Now, what we'd like to do is we'd like to do another physical exercise. Everybody just turn your head around like this. Very good. Clockwise. 
anti-clockwise, hands on your hips, move forward, okay, move it back, move to the right, move to the left, wonderful. Now you see, being from Uganda, and you know, us people from the Horn of Africa, we have rhythm, and being people of rhythm, you can't do exercise without music. So what we like to do is just put on some music. James, can I have some music, please? Music. So this is the favorite Ugandan music, okay? I want everybody to learn this. Okay, hands in the air. Everybody turn around, around. All right, all right, hands on the hips. All right, move your hands around, hips around. Okay, DJ, cut, 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 cut. You didn't come here to dance, you came here to work. Let's sit down, please. We are losing focus. Let's sit down here, please. Very good. Now that we are, we are all back and focused, um, I'd like to, to quickly apologize because in our presence, we happen to have one of our partners. And you see, our partners have been reviewing and seeing us for the last couple of, of, of days. I'd like to say this dancing just happened today. So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, to invite to the podium the head of the development corporation at the Embassy of Sweden from Kampala, Mr. Ola Holgren. Please welcome him as he comes to the, to the podium. And Mr. Ola, I'll just put it on, on record that this dancing just happened now. We have been serious for the last three days. So kindly take the podium. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think uh, nothing can be more serious than a little bit of exercise and dancing at the tail end of, of a long, long conference. I don't know whether it was uh, intentional, but I'm happy that this happened before my, my I promise to be not too lengthy speech at, the, at, at this conference. Uh, as mentioned, I'm, my name is Ulla Holgren. I'm, I'm, head of the, I'm head of development cooperation at the Swedish embassy here in Kampala. And, and uh, I have attended part of it, part of this conference in person, uh, also followed it from afar. And we have had people from our regional office in, in, uh, in Addis Ababa, uh, who actually have, are, are the ones that are supporting the program, the EGAD program that, that, that uh, in part uh, supports also this conference. Uh, I have learned something, uh, I have been here in the country for the last four years. Uh, it's a long period for a diplomat to stay in a country. It, it, it is proof of how much I've enjoyed the country and, and the people here. It's at the same time a short period. Uh, so if I say something that about Uganda and or something that you have, you are the experts on the issues that you have discussed, please uh, Please uh, for, for, forgive me or correct me if you so see fit. But I think over the last uh, over the past three days, the conference has discussed and highlighted the linkage between land from a number of aspects. Land and peace and security, I believe, was the focus of day one. Land and access to justice was the focus day two. Land and climate change and food system, the focus of, of, of day three. Uh, I'm sure, since the, the issues are interlinked, that there has been a little bit of movement between these topics, but these are the three, the three areas that were highlighted. And I think the common denominator in all the, these discussions is how aspects related to land impacts people in the region, severely and dramatically impacts the land has on their lives. The significance of addressing land issues, I think, cannot be overemphasized. I think the world faces, we know that the world now faces a food security crisis of enormous scale. Uh, 
and the challenges facing the Horn of Africa and the Egan region are really daunting, unprecedented even. And taking some of the figures that, that, that comes from EGAD uh, Conference of Ministers, I think the region accounts for about one-fifth of, of the number of people categorized as being in crisis or more, uh, with close to 50 million people projected to fall into this category this year alone. And Somalia, and in Somalia and South Sudan, more than 300,000 people are projected to face catastrophic conditions, with some 10 million children under, under five suffering from malnutrition. This situation, as we've heard, has many causes, causes that are complex, com causes that are interrelated. Uh, climate change, the vari variability of climate, uh, has been mentioned, the competition from, for, for resources, conflicts, whether it's outright uh, armed conflicts or, or fragile peace and security situations, diseases such as COVID and pests, uh, the locust invasions have had an effect. And what, what I heard now in the last session uh, a little bit, uh, not a little bit, but much emphasized was also the, the, the war economy and the, the the, the political context, also corruption being mentioned uh, as, as part, as is the quality and, and presence of institutions. The list can be made longer. I think the important point to make is just the fact that these issues are interrelated, that they need to be addressed simultaneously, and the people closest to the ground uh, know, know what to address first and how to address them. As I said, I've been here in Uganda during the past four years. And, and uh, uh, let me a little bit turn to the situation as I've, I have experienced it here over, over that period of, of time. Uh, I've noticed that tensions over land and other resources have increased with high incidences of land rights, violations, forced evictions, etc. cetera. Uh, you, can, you can see it, you hear about it, you hear about colleagues speaking about it in the office, you see, you see it in the news, you see it in papers. This particularly in the northern regions and the Albertine regions. And another issue uh, here in Uganda is, is the, uh, the number of former IDPs, particularly again in northern Uganda, still face major poverty and reintegration challenges. The effects of climate change leads to increased competition for natural resources, such as firewood, and give rise to frictions between IDPs and local communities. And here, the high dependency on biomass for energy in Uganda, uh, the, the figure that has been quoted to me is 90%, which is quite a staggering figure, really, uh, not only relating to household, but I also learned when we launched a program in, in the area of energy efficiency, that, that, for example, the tea industry here, for, for heating purposes, uses firewood to a large extent. Uh, that is, of course, that increases the competition for, for, for that particular natural resource and, and, and give rise to conflicts around that. I will not repeat. Uh, I, I, I was much impressed, and I'm sure everyone that has been present here has been impressed by, by, by the knowledge from, from the delegates from the, from, the, from the region that have come to share their experiences and their solutions. But let me just before closing mention a little bit about the long-standing partnership with EGA that Sweden enjoys. Uh, a partnership that, that in, includes many areas, institutional support, land governance, peace and security, gender integration, migration, just to mention a few. A conference such as this speaks volumes about the importance of EGAD, I think, and, and let me reaffirm our will and our attention to continue to work with EGAD. Here in Uganda, we, we, we complement the work that is being done by, by support uh, linked to the issues that you have discussed here. And let me, let me end by mentioning a few of those. Well, we have one, one such example. It's a three-year peace-building program that is implemented by Safer World that, among others, focuses on land as a conflict driver, one of, one of I think, four or five conflict drivers that, ha that has been identified. 
and this is a program that, that has a focus on northern and western regions of Uganda. We also support a five-year com community justice program, which is implemented by IDLOAD to enhance uh, access to justice for marginal and vulnerable communities. And here we know that land justice and land issues figure prominently. Last but not least, a five-year program with FAO as our agreement partner that aims at strengthening uh, climate smart resilience for rural women in Karamoja and West Nile regions, focusing on such things as tenure security, agricultural adaptation and watershed management. Let me just end by stating the obvious. Nothing, I think, uh, can be more important to focus, in, focus on than land, than land issues. It, it brings together so many aspects that all are important. But as someone said immediately before here, let, let us put land front and center and, and start the, the discussions from there. I wish I would have been able to participate more in, in the deliberation during these days. But let me just say how happy I am that the conference has taken place and, and by the even before that dance that we ended with, I could sense a lot of energy in the room. So thank you so much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Ola Holgren, Head of Development Corporation at the Embassy of Sweden here in Uganda. So to have a better understanding of what has transpired over the last couple of days, I'm very proud to call to the front, Mr. Conrad Bosire. Conrad happens to be the official conference rapporteur, and he's going to be taking us through the draft conference report. J'aimerais vous dire que c'est seulement provisoire. So if si vous voyez de, de, any, anything which doesn't look very correct en tant que grammaire, orthographe et tout, tout ça, on va les changer après. And it'll be cleaned up afterwards. So this is just provisional. This is just a draft. And um, let's give him a round of applause as he walks up. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Mitch. Uh, uh, distinguished uh, delegates, uh, participants. Um, as you've heard, uh, my name is uh, Conrad uh, Bosire. And uh, together with uh, Eric Thige, maybe you can stand up for the delegates uh, to see you. And with the help of uh, Stefano, uh, we formed the core team that uh, developed and recorded uh, the proceedings and the deliberations uh, in this uh, uh, conference. But also to mention that uh, we didn't work just the three of us. As you realize, over the three days, we have had numerous sessions on numerous sub-themes based on the three themes, main themes of the conference. And therefore, we have relied on uh, diverse teams from the secretariats of the organizing institutions uh, to come up uh, with what we have. Just to reiterate from what uh, the <clears throat> program uh, director has mentioned is that what we have here is um, following the conference high level issues uh, that uh, we picked up. And as you know, after this, we have the directors and the ministries coming up with a communique from here based on the themes of the conference. And therefore, please, uh, if there's anything uh, missing from the points that we've mentioned, as you've heard, we'll edit the language, make the points stronger and all that. But if there's something that is critical and missing, having participated in all these uh, sessions and also keeping in mind, not everyone was in every meeting that issues were discussed. Please, this is your opportunity uh, to help us make the document better to communicate the issues and to get the actions uh, that um, uh, we needed. So we just have a very brief uh, introduction uh, up there. We need not go to uh, that. But just to recap, that on the first day, we were told that uh, this is the first time that uh, a meeting of this nature is being hosted by the government of Uganda, and mainly because of the nature of participants here a diverse collection from government delegations, from land and experts, civil society, development partners, international organizations, or uh, who converged here for these uh, issues. And I need not mention uh, the main themes of the conference. They were well elaborated in the programs and also distributed through the programs in the three main days, all 
ranging from prioritizing and promoting responsible conflict, sensitive, inclusive land and natural justice governance and access to justice, and sustainable allocation of uh, land use, uh, securing local land rights to support climate change, realizing women's and girls' equal rights to land and all that. And these were broken down to three daily themes, land, conflict, peace, and security, access to justice, responsible land governance, and the three, land rights, climate, and food systems. The theme of gender, being an arcing and recurring theme, was mainstreamed within the three main themes. And just to mention, in the three days, we have five distinct sessions to interrogate various gender-specific issues related to vulnerability in matters of land justice and land governors as they obtain uh, in, the, uh, in the region and uh, the, the, the issues being considered within uh, the region. So allow me to go into the key and emerging issues that we considered. And just to explain the structure, we started with the broad background and information. Then we have identified the key and emerging issues that were considered during the program. And here we have gone thematic across all the sessions and tried, as I said, to pull high level points uh, that were discussed throughout the various uh, sessions. So the first point here is that in uh, the region that we are considering, rangelands are multifunctional. So that when you talk about use, you are not just having one form of utilization in mind. They are multivariate and they border around uses and economic activities for various uh, activities and all deliberations must not be unidirectional, they must bear in mind the diverse activities. The second major point that uh, was mentioned is the need to balance the legitimate responsibilities of the state vis-a-vis uh, -vis the interests of the communities, their livelihoods, and all that, and to, stri to strike a legitimate balance because all these are uh, necessary, the second major point. Then... <clears throat> We also have the, in all these governance processes and the outcomes usually and in implementation has been that women um, are hurt by the governance policies and land governance uh, issues. They, are, they come out as a victim of process and yet uh, they have the agency to be uh, core stakeholders and to lead uh, discussions in this. As we know, the content of all these activities has women uh, at the center of it and with that uh, intention of enhancing uh, control and uh, having them as the stakeholders in all these uh, processes. We all know about climate change and its impact and the way it is uh, forming the basis of conflict in the region, very important. And then we also have issues of boundaries and identities overlapping all around the region, including boundaries between states and within uh, states, a very important issue as we discuss this important um, uh, theme or uh, themes. There are different levels of planning and responses, and here basically we are talking about from the community, village, household level, all the way to national, regional, continental, and global. For instance, when you talk about investments, you are talking about multinational corporations operating globally vis-a-vis -vis the interests of communities and families and individuals at the local level. We need to consider all those levels, the various interests, and how they need to be effectively involved. Uh, communities, uh, communities at the local level need to occupy the center driver seat in shaping and crafting policies and laws that affect their way of life. Their representation and voice is critical in all the levels we mentioned above. That was also emphasized. We also talked about the plurality of legal systems. And this point was mentioned countless times by almost all speakers who spoke on this issue, and they need to ensure coherence between formal and informal justice uh, systems. And the phrase that was thrown around a lot is a multi-door approach to administration of justice. Vulnerable groups, individuals, and communities suffer disproportionately uh, whenever there's a disruption of their lives and livelihoods. And in all these categories, we need to consider that uh, and, and ensure that uh, special rights are actually taken care of in uh, responses. 
Information and capacity gaps at all levels, from the communities to professionals to national level and regional level players international, we all need to consider capacity and information gaps that we require to fill in order to ensure that all these issues are addressed. So if you're moving with me, the next point is quite important. This is what will form the basis. Of course, the background issues which I've just mentioned, but this is what will form the basis of the communique that the ministers are going to sign at the end of this week. Uh, and, it, and, and the communique, the meat of the communique is contained in the deliberations that we have had since Monday on all these issues. So, number one, and these are very clear and straightforward recommendations on land use and management, review and reform existing institutions on land governance and administration, including clarifying relationships between different government institutions and levels of government on matters related to land governance, including roles of local community-based governance structures. Very loaded and broad, but quite clear to the point on what we need to do in terms of institutions. Review existing national legal and policy frameworks on land use and management to secure land rights, protect the rights of women and youth and vulnerable social groups that are affected in land use management, comprehensive policies and action plans on land use and management in each member countries, taking into account the interconnection with food security, climate change, and natural resource management. Promote the application of the existing guideline principles of large-scale land-based investments issued uh, by AU, we'll correct that small typo, the African Development Bank and the Economic Commission for Africa, this setting the pace for proper investment that takes into account all the issues we are talking about. Review and develop national policies on uh, investments, building on the best practices recorded in various SIGAT countries and even from other countries in the region which have good practices uh, to borrow from. Support policy reforms to advance fair and equitable participation in community-based la land and natural resource management processes, share and adopt practices from member states uh, that have led to use, better use and management of land, collect and update data and information on land use patterns, land values, traditional land users, titles, land holders, leases, and all the informations necessary for monitoring and uh, evaluating the patterns of uh, sound policies of uh, land and natural resource management. Develop and adopt technologies that can support inclusion and involvement in land use management. So friendly technologies that are sensitive to the needs of various groups and which enhance sound policies of land management and dispute uh, resolution. Then the second major area of recommendations is on conflict prevention and access to justice. If you notice, uh, these generally follow the themes that were laid out at the beginning of the conference. So we try to methodically follow that, follow that with um, uh, systematic uh, recommendations. So one here, of course, in one of the presentations we had of the early warning and conflict response mechanisms uh, by uh, EGAD. So one of the recommendations is to follow and uh, use this uh, warning uh, system and address that as the warnings come. Text and steps to ensure coherence and harmonious coexistence of multiple systems of administration of justice. We've heard about uh, the traditional systems and the consensus coming out is that these systems are not necessarily bad. They are very good norms that can be incorporated in actual resolution of disputes relating to land and natural resources. We need to take that part and then harmonize it with the formal justice systems that uh, we have resolve and disentangle the multiple overlapping and conflicting interests on the rights on the formal and informal land tenure systems. So basically securing land rights, whether uh, from the formal system, informal, and ensuring that they form the basis of safeguarding rights of the various uh, groups. Entrench ADR mechanisms, and this is the broad range of mediation and negotiation into the formal legal system while resolving uh, disputes. You had specific examples from countries on this. Support and strengthen the alternative justice systems, including the, the traditional dispute resolution mechanisms, and ensuring that women and youth rights are underscored, discriminatory practices outlawed, and forbidding uh, or controlling um, the, the use of multiple forums which create uh, inefficiencies. Improve participation of both women and youth in alternative justice systems, not, just, not only as justice 
seekers, but also as partakers uh, in the justice process and as right holders. Uh, seek to establish specialized courts. Uh, that's one of the specific uh, lessons that uh, came through and a broad recommendation with the various issues to take into account, ensuring that the, the, the operationalization of courts is in harmony with the multiple justice systems for overall effectiveness. And legal aid came out as a point in this because of the cost of access, especially to the formal justice system. It's a substantial point. We also, uh, talked about capacity development and knowledge management. This comes from the information and knowledge gaps that exist at all levels, uh, from the communities to international players. We need to look at uh, the capacity of all the players at all levels and see what we need to do in order to grow those capacities for them to be active uh, partakers. National awareness plans on gender and intergenerational responsiveness, public awareness, engagement strategies on land use and management, uh, uh, management and uh, conflict uh, resolution. Build the capacity of formal and informal justice sectors, uh, justice sector actors to solve land disputes and embrace ADR. Be build the capacity of institutions, uh, local governments, state departments in areas such as climate change, climate finance, monitoring and reporting, because in some way they are contributors to conflict and can actually be a positive contribution we well understood and applied. Climate change in the education system in order for uh, the young people going through the learning system to be acquainted uh, with these issues. Ensure development, dissemination and access to information uh, for members of the public on issues related to land governance, access to justice and other relevant themes for the empowerment of citizens uh, through knowledge. Then on uh, women's meaningful participation in land governance and dispute resolution, as I said, we had uh, five distinct sessions interrogating various issues of women's meaningful participation in this area. So the first point that came out very prominently is to reform laws and policies that prevent women from ownership, use, and management of land and natural resources. That came out very clearly. And it also came out, it's not just the traditional systems, but also even the formal systems that we have. Uh, I've done this and that, and uh, we need reforms across the board to empower uh, women to be active partakers as they are uh, in, uh, in land governance issues. Cross-sectoral consultation. Here, as we said, uh, land governance is not just on the land sector. It affects various other sectors, social uh, economic, political, we need cross-sectoral consultation in order to have holistic approaches. Strengthen the capacity of women to engage in advocacy and policy making, promote uh, access of women to credit, resources to be available uh, to women and to facilitate uh, their participation, ensure provision of legal aid, uh, specifically to women justice seekers, and more notably at the local level where this is missing. A point came out that this is usually available in the capital and in the villages and the local level. It's glaringly missing, so we need community level engagement and access uh, to legal uh, aid. Ensure meaningful participation of uh, women local leaders to engage in policy making at all levels, starting from the community level. On climate change and natural resources management, support the development of inclusive and accessible technologies that respond to climate change, such as stress tolerant crops, irrigation, early warning systems, ETC. Promote the contextual diversification of livelihoods among households and contextual here meaning that uh, there is full participation, informed participation of those who are being, who are participating in the economic transformation. Encourage agronomic practices such as agroforestry and conservation agriculture, of course, bearing in mind the prevailing context and whether these methods are applicable. Pest and vector surveillance and management, there's actually a point that was made that invasive plant species have in some areas contributed to conflict because of the eating away of grazing land. So that is, it may appear a minor point, but it's actually backed up by substantial issues in the field. 
each member state to develop a strategy for incorporating and appropriating indigenous knowledge and strategies in climate change and natural resources management that came out in the sessions that discussed climate change within these broad themes. Then, uh, the second last area that we pointed out is on regional efforts and integration. And here we are saying, let's redouble the efforts in the implementation of the protocol on transhumans, the, Ign the IGAD protocol on transhumans. So we already have a protocol in place which identifies uh, standards and also a roadmap towards there. So we need not start this from the scratch. There's already a mechanism that we need to activate within our spaces and we have norms and standards to aspire to already. So let's activate that. Encourage sustainable and equitable use and management of transboundary resources as sources of peace and unity among member states. Already we have examples within the domestic setting we were told that the regional setting, the pace is a bit slower. Maybe we can try and replicate that. Support international and regional organizations and civil society groups articulating for accountability and transparency in land governance and women's rights to land. So here, basically promoting standards that uh, allow openness, transparency, and active participation. And these can be regional standards adopted at uh, regional forum like uh, uh, eager and supporting institutions. Support the establishment of regional oversight mechanisms to ensure that member state countries adopt best land governance practices in the region to protect and ensure the best use of their respective uh, lands. Then the final point that uh, we recorded for the conference is about resource mobilization. You realize from points one to six, we require certain kinds of resources be it expertise, be it financial, be it material, uh, capacity development has resource implications. All these uh, development of regional norms and standards, they all require some form of uh, resource mobilization and support. So the final one is a call for international development partners and even the member states, uh, we need to add that here to support operationalization of this uh, transformative uh, agenda. So. Uh, myself, together with the group that uh, we worked on, and uh, so far what we have, these are the deliberations and the main points from those themes that came out and which will form uh, the basis of uh, the communique that uh, the directors and ministers will discuss after this organization. I welcome your points and inputs. As we said, we'll refine the language, we'll pull the commas and full stops. But if there's any substantial issue or point that you think needs to fit somewhere in where we have said or additional areas, this is your opportunity to assist us to make this document better so that it can communicate accurately the deliberations and issues that we have had over the last uh, three days, uh, including uh, today. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Conrad. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure now to welcome the Honorable Member of Parliament for Chiboga to give us a few words and give us her insights. Please welcome the Honorable Kaya Christine Nachimuero. Big round of applause as she makes her way. Good evening to you all, Right Honorable Minister, our staff from the ministry, the line ministry, and also staff from the relevant institutions of our government here in Uganda, our visitors from the East and the Horn of Africa, you're most welcome. Uh, like I was introduced, I'm Kaya Christine Nachimoero. Uh, Chiboga District Human Member of Parliament, but also I'm the Shadow Minister for Water and Environment and also the Chairperson for the Uganda Parliamentarians Land Management Forum. 
This was a forum that was established this year. We just wanted to put a record of establishing such a forum in the 11th parliament of Uganda. As parliament of Uganda, we have the infrastructure committee. But like the name suggests, we thought that if we establish the forum, we would accommodate more members to deliberate on land governance and dispute matters. Generally, uh, improve the debate on land issues. Because the formal committee only includes around 32 members of parliament. Yet the Ugandan parliament has over 529 members. And like the name suggests, it was like most of the land related issues would be accorded special committees to investigate, to research, and then come back and report to parliament. Much of the concentration of the committee would be on uh, infrastructure development, urban development, housing, and we could much of the uh, issues on land matters would be left to these other special committees. So we felt that it was very important to include all members of parliament in the debate on land, owing to the fact that every member of parliament actually has a land conflict in his or her constituency. So based on my previous engagement with the civil society on land issues, I felt that if I become a member of parliament, that would be my first target to ensure that I coordinate with the rest of the members and we establish this committee. So we are happy that it is in place now, legally registered and ready to move on. So we, I have been working with a number of members here in the past years, and I am happy that they have moved on. They have kept on the promise of the debate, and I can assure you that for sure from here, we are rejuvenated as land actors in our different capacities. Uh, when we established uh, the, the, the forum, we also perceived it another a mechanism through which the different stakeholders can channel their interests or grievances or matters on land to the parliament of Uganda following the uh, different uh, responsibilities of the parliament, including the oversight role. We wanted to ensure that as members move to their respective uh, uh, constituencies, they actually follow up with the issues on land. And then the representation part of it, when we go back to parliament during plenary, we should be able to fast track for example, how far has the Land Act been implemented? What are the uh, issues at hand? What should really Parliament take on as far as land issues are concerned? So in the representation role of the members. The other one is the legislation. That is why I've been paying very much attention on some of the policies that have been working, that are working for the different nations here. And I've learned a lot. Is it the policy that can enable us implement so well? Is it the act? And then what other guidelines can other um, sectors take on? Uh, we expect to review a number of uh, uh, policies here in Uganda related to land. And we expect that through this legislative role of, mem of the members of parliament, we also prioritize. And then the issue of appropriation. There are a number of uh, uh, items in, a settle in the settlement of uh, many of the land disputes. There is a lot of compensation where people would like governments to compensate them. But what will they use if what we appropriate to the land sector is almost nothing? Budgetary allocations need to come out clearly. But it is the members of parliament to keep questioning how much have you allocated to this sector. 
How much is, has been allocated? For example, in Uganda, we have the land fund to compensate uh, the absentee landlords. How much is, is it enough anyway? So the issue of appropriation, using our role as members of parliament to at least assign some reasonable budget and advocate for it. Otherwise, if we all keep quiet, uh, the sector may get uh, limited funding. So currently we are in the process of uh, uh, establishing a strategic plan for the forum to guide the rest of the members of the parliament. But we are re recognizing the fact that there is an increased, there is a rise in land disputes in Uganda, probably in also other countries. Uh, we still have some colonial legacies where you find that they uh, make the same piece of land to be owned by more than one person. And the border disputes are also becoming many. As countries, we have not defined our capacities. How many of the refugees are you able to sustain as a country? Look at your different countries. And how far have you, I mean, have you reached the capacity? Are you halfway? Is the population you are targeted, you have targeted, finished? Are you increasingly inviting more refugees? As countries, we need to define our capacities such that we do not put a lot of pressure on the natural resources we have, but also on land. And then the climate change related disasters are becoming many. Based on the research, over 70% of the disasters are now climate change related. And much of the effect on land actually is behind the change in land uses. Some land uses are cognizant of the vulnerabilities of some people, but others want to completely sweep away everybody, even when you are a legal, a legal tenant. So we would like to ensure that at least good enough when they list the interventions on climate change management, we hope that uh, the issues related to land management as a resource are catered for, and uh, our people, especially the vulnerable group, is still catered, and we're reducing on the disputes. But uh, the issues of segregation, especially among women and girls, is still also a challenge, and this is uh, increased by the cultural norms. You are included, but actually you are excluded when you're a girl, you will get from your husband. When you're at the husband's side, you came from somewhere. So you are not anywhere. And uh, practically, we see that. People may not say it, but in practice, you see that we, we, they, they, they pretend to include us, but we already excluded. And then uh, we would like to encourage all stakeholders to take part to ensure that the issues reach the national level. Sometimes I keep reminding some of the partners, how do you say you are in national advocacy without the parliament? Which national advocacy are you talking about when the parliament is not in your stakeholders? So let's say involve the parliament to ensure that our issues are recognized nationally even internationally. Right now, I'm not talking to the Ugandan parliament, all the Ugandan nationals alone, but the issues are going to the rest of the countries in the Eastern Horn of Africa. So we are very happy about the recognition of the policies and laws in place to help us national and internationally. And we would like you to get interested in working with parliament more. Because many of the challenges have hinted on the lack of implementation and enforcement. But uh, as well as monitoring, also waking up those people in slumber, I think parliament is good at that. So it is not good to run away from us, to hide away from us, or hide information, I know very many countries have conducted research, but sharing of the research results and reports becomes a challenge because they feel the research observations 
a sour, a bitter, a against the state interests. But we are also calling on the international bodies. IGAD, we shall be waiting on you to remind us it is good to incorporate the state interests. But what happens when the state interests are against the populace interests? Who is going to tame and remind us, hello, Uganda, hello, Ethiopia, you have gone astray there. What you are advocating for is not for this. We are calling on you, international bodies, to keep reminding us, to wake us up if we are in slumber, thinking that we are for the people when actually we are for personal interests and not even state interests. So thank you so much. Uh, the time I was accorded, few minutes. Uh, I hope I have made uh, a point in here and we are looking forward to improve the debate on land issues, especially governance and land dispute uh, resolution. And the Bible says, make a joyful shout to the Lord. I think for us we should say, and we should commit to make a joyful, rejuvenated, committed, concern, redress to land issues. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister. Ladies and gentlemen, now it's my great pleasure to welcome the head of the IGAD mission here in Uganda to give us a couple of closing statements and also to invite our state minister. Please welcome Lucy Daxbacher. Big round of applause. Um, thank you very much, my brother Mish. Uh, you're doing a very good job, and you are as strong as all of us. We thank you. Um, excellencies, the Honorable Minister, my senior brother, Honorable Obiga Kanea, the distinguished officials and experts of IGAD member states, and ESC partner states present, the distinguished delegates from all our partner agencies who have organized this very high level conference, also the distinguished experts of civil society, academia, the media who have been part of this process. I would like again to say I'm deeply humbled to once again speak to you for a few minutes because this has been a very useful journey in addressing one of the most important issues in peace, security, and regional integration of our region. And I would like to say on behalf of His Excellency, the Executive Secretary of IGAD, Dr. Workene Gebeyehu, we are deeply grateful to the government of Uganda. We are deeply grateful yesterday, Her Excellency, the Vice President, my sister, Jessica Lupo was with us. The Honorable Minister for Lands, Honorable Nabakoba was with us. The Chief Justice was with us. Honorable Minister, also several of your colleagues were with us and very high level distinguished officials of the governments of these member states. Honorable Minister, with your permission, I would like to make a remark for the sake of the distinguished participants and also our rapporteurs. You made mention of the Transhumans Protocol for IGAD region. Now, I would like, on behalf of the IGAD Secretariat, to request member states that you sign on to this protocol ratify it so that we can implement it. You cannot implement a protocol which you have not signed and which you have not ratified yet. Graciously, the Republic of Sudan and the Republic of South Sudan have already signed the protocol. And we request the remaining five member states to do the same because the Transhumans Protocol is one of the remedies, is one of the instruments 
that will support us to manage conflicts with regard to access to resources of water, pasture, and salt leaks in our region. Secondly, Honorable Minister, Chief Guest, I would also like to inform Member States it is the same with the IGAD protocol on free movement of persons in IGAD region. It is going through the same process. We request the remaining member states, the five member states, to also sign this protocol on free movement of persons in our region. Reason being that Article 16 of that protocol on free movement of persons in IGAD region exactly enjoins member states to support our citizens who are forcibly displaced in the situation of natural disasters and natural calamities which, as you know, Honorable Minister, conflicts and natural disasters are cyclical and endemic in our region. And therefore, Article 16 of this protocol is very important. So I would like to request again the Ministries of Foreign Affairs to have internal dialogue towards the signing of both of these protocols, and I request the rapporteurs to take note of this. Excellency Honorable Minister, we would like to express our deepest appreciation as IGAD Secretariat to the National Organizing Committee that has tirelessly worked towards the success of this conference. They started working together over three months ago, and my senior and distinguished sister, Naume, is here. She has been supporting us. We have given us sleepless nights, and we are really grateful. And I would really express gratitude also to the team at the Ministry, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Lands, Minister of Health, Office of the President. The whole of government has given us a lot of support. And therefore, as IGAD Secretariat, I believe with the member states, we shall always come back to Uganda to do similar undertakings. Now, Excellency, I have a very humble action to do. And that is really to invite you to address us. You have been supporting us from the office, and now we have the honor to invite you here to address us. Welcome, sir. She forgot to say that uh, I'm supposed to address you and close the meeting. <laughs> but she's right, because I have no intention of closing such a beautiful meeting. So actually, I'm going to reopen the meeting. And uh, I want to ask our people the protocol to work with the Minister of Lands and Foreign Affairs to find us that protocol which we were supposed to sign, ratify. And I want to assure EGAD that we will move at the highest speed that God gives us to make sure that we sign that protocol. Uh, I Reluctantly, don't want to refer to offices. I don't want to make some mistakes by omitting some people. But I will simply say the members of parliament, representatives of development partners who are around, the government officials. All of you distinguished participants, the press, ladies and gentlemen, I take this opportunity to thank you for the discussions you have had for the last two days 
and the resolutions that you have passed thereon. The subject of land, a finite asset to humanity, is inevitable that it must generate conflicts, particularly when we see the increases in population and so forth. So it was only appropriate that you come here and you discuss on this very important issue and make the relevant resolutions that you have made. From the conflicts of land, many of our people in communities, not only now, but even in historical times have suffered. And it is sad to know that there are more people suffering because of land conflicts now. In a generation that will proclaim itself more civilized than our forefathers. We know more, we have more facilities, we have better technology. So why should our people continue to suffer because of land conflicts? Why should we be unable to resolve them? However, we know there are land conflicts between families, friends, communities, and these must be addressed. You have passed a number of resolutions, and I'm reliably informed that these are going to be sent to the ministers in their meetings from tomorrow for further discussion. And on behalf of those ministers, I want to assure you that we shall try our best to make sure that they are adopted, improved, and taken to our countries to be implemented. You have talked about justice, access to justice, peace and security, land rights, climate change, food systems, realization of the ownership of rights to land for both men and women, girls and boys, inter-country or cross-border conflicts, and you have shared many experiences from each country. These are very fertile resources which will be able to enrich the discussions at the ministerial level. I think our, as far as the regions and the countries in Igad are concerned, our enemies let me call them enemies, I'm sorry. Those who don't wish us well must really be suffering, I mean, must be laughing at us. Because by nature, most of our countries are well endowed, very well endowed, with the rain, with the soils, with the climate. And yet, we are now the people with worse land conflicts. Sometimes we're even unable to feed our own people because of land conflicts, changes in the climate. Why? So these are the issues that you've gathered here and you have, for which you have tried to provide solutions. And we do hope they will go a long way in resolving the issue of land conflicts in our countries. On behalf of the government of Uganda, I want to thank the International Development Land Organization for supporting IGAD towards resolving land conflicts in the region. I pledge that Uganda will take the lead and ensure that the recommendations from this high level meeting are incorporated in our national land policy. 
which is currently undergoing review. We have a very, there's no time for me to go in the details. I don't know whether the Ugandan delegations gave you the details, but we have a very, in my view, a very well constructed national land policy. What probably we are left with is approving it and forcing its implementation. And we should be able to address many of the issues that you have raised. For example, in Uganda, the issue of women being disenfranchised over the ownership of land, at policy level has really been resolved. The land law itself is very clear. Recently, the government and the parliament from which my sister addressed you here, passed the amendments to the marriage law and other relevant laws which have taken into consideration the Equal Opportunities Act, all those are provided for the entitlement of women and girls as far as land is concerned. Perhaps in Uganda, as I've said, our biggest challenge is implementation. And I promise you, from this conference, we've been awake further to go and see how far we're implementing. The new recommendations will be the basis for implementation during the next 10 years of land conflict resolutions in Uganda. This, of course, will require financial support. And it will be in our interest, and indeed in the interest of all the governments of the IGAD region to make sure that they look into their budgets and allocate adequate resources to cover for these financial reserve for these conflicts, resolution of these conflicts. Like I said at the beginning, land conflicts are there to stay. And if you don't resolve them, they can only escalate. And therefore, it is in the interest of the countries that they must allocate more resources to the resolution of land conflicts. And of course, we will appeal to our development partners to support us. But it is also important that we make our own efforts as well. I would like to appreciate all those who have contributed to the success of this high level meeting. I particularly wanted to thank IGAD. IGAD, you have done wonderful things in this country. <clears throat> Needless to say, I don't, I don't want to list them, but there are quite many. Personally, my first conduct with the IGAD, I think, was in 19. 17, where we got involved in the resolution of our demarcation of our borders with the DRC. Just demarcation. That was causing a lot of conflicts. And there are still many in the Igad region. We're fighting over them. Instead of building one region which can be economically strong, land conflicts the issue of the the one you discussed here about the war economy is related to land conflicts so those must be resolved finally I do hope particularly for our visitors that you have had a good time. I do hope. But there's nothing enough in Uganda. Even the little you have had is just little. I ask you, before you depart to your different destinations, secure a few more days to enjoy Uganda's wonderful flora and the fauna. 
The hospitality is guaranteed for you. So don't miss it. I wish you a very good return thereafter to your various destinations. I have to do what I didn't want to do. For the sake of those who have already thought I've spoken too long, I now have the pleasure to declare this conference closed. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause to our Honorable Minister of State. Wow. It's been an amazing three days, ladies and gentlemen. For those of you who don't want to go home, I think we must listen to our Minister of State. Please book another three or four days to enjoy Uganda and the beauty that it has, the wildlife, the people, the places. Feel free to contact me because I know a lot of nice places to go and enjoy yourself. So pour tous les personnes qui ne veulent pas partir à la maison, ne vous inquiétez pas, je sais où on peut partir se, se, se relaxer après. So faites-moi signe et je vous donnerai des directions. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure as you depart to just leave you with a few parting notes. First of all, I think it would only be fair that as we go, we thank the, the committee that put this entire thing together. Let's just have, let's have them all stand up, the entire EGAD and IDEO team who put this entire thing together. Let's give them a big round of applause. They've done an amazing job. Thank you so much. It's been an awesome last three days. What's going to happen is that we've been putting together special videos. You've seen the clips. So we'll have the team from IDLO and from EGAD get you these clips. They'll send it to you. So you'll have a chance to, to be famous when you go back home. Um, at the same time, we'd like to make a special announcement that tomorrow there's going to be a meeting of the directors. It's going to start at 9 a.m. It's a closed meeting for invitees only. And it's starting at... 9 a.m. at the Regal Hall. So if you've been invited, demain, so pour tous les, les, les directeurs, ça commence à 9h du matin, en bas, in the Regal Hall. So it's my great pleasure as Dr. Ronnie Michigong. I'd like to wish you all safe travels. May God bless and I hope to see you too. All right. Partez-vous bien. Thank you.